As a uh, board-certified urologist, I became uh, uh, very fascinated when I was exposed to the uh, mission of the uh, A4M and actually uh, uh, completed the fellowship, and it really helped me become a better physician. And for all of you that deal with, uh, with men, I think it's important to understand that many of the things that I'm going to show you today will hopefully help you become better clinicians, and it does have an application uh, to you, particularly as the population ages, if we can uh, impart some knowledge as to how we can look at the uh, preventative measures to disease, that um, uh, you certainly will fulfill a lot of the need f uh, for your patients, particularly as it relates to uh, uh, the uh, uh, increasing number of older patients and the decreasing number of urologists, particularly, that will be able to deal with them. Um, <clears throat> Benign prostatic enlargement, or a term we use, lower urinary tract symptoms and erectile dysfunction should be important, as I mentioned, to uh, anti-aging physicians. They are significant men's health issues that often are associated with aging and are increased uh, incidence that occurs uh, with aging. It does affect quality of life when patients come in and complain about getting up two, three, four times a night. It, it appears they're asleep uh, uh, and it appears they're functioning in the workplace. Uh, the chronicity of these symptoms oftentimes can obviously affect the rep reparative processes that occur during sleep and the release of growth hormone. And uh, these are uh, uh, proper uh, voiding and uh, erectile function are indicators of youth and vitality, as we all know. I, I'm reminded of this every morning when I hear my three young sons uh, and how they, uh, when they urinate, and then I listen to my stream, it's quite a difference. Uh, as I see the, the underlying uh, explanations for many of these disease states, and even though we're dealing specifically with the genitourinary tract in my lecture, it's the same concepts of uh, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction which can affect the whole patient in a multitude of different uh, facets and, and, and clinically manifested disease states. And so that understanding this and how it relates to the lower urinary tract is important, and we can see also a connection to the rest of the body. Uh, many of you remember this from medical school, and we can see here on the uh, on your left, uh, a normal bladder with a normal-sized prostate and a urethra that uh, uh, goes through the prostate gland. And on the right, we can see a prostate that has been affected by chronic outlet obstruction and hypertrophy. And you can see how the detrusor muscle thickens, and as a result of that, it loses its elasticity. There's an increased pressure gradient inside the, uh, the bladder, which is transmitted into the kidneys. And varying degrees of this enlargement of the prostate can result in a uh, multitude of different clinical uh, symptoms that obstructs the urinary flow and, and allows the patient to, uh, and actually brings the patient to the, uh, to the office for um, evaluation and treatment. My discussion will deal primarily with benign prostatic enlargement, and it is caused by growth of uh, new cells resulting in various degrees of bladder outlet obstruction. The symptoms, as, as I mentioned, urgency, frequency, nighttime urination, which is the most common symptom that presents patients to the office, hesitancy, intermittency, incontinence in severe cases, and, and oftentimes even urinary tract infection or upper tract deterioration, and in very extreme cases of uh, renal failure. It's important to understand that not everybody with lower urinary tract symptoms have BPH. And it's very important to rule out other underlying causes, cancer, uh, bladder cancer, uh, infection, neurogenic uh, dysfunction, and that once we've ruled out these other uh, possible causes, then we can then address our therapy uh, to uh, BPH. Uh, this is a comparison between the age-specific prevalence of clinical and histologic BPH. And then we can see here that there's an age-related increase in the incidence, not just of the histological BPH, but also of those patients that present clinically to the office. And actually, after coronary artery disease, uh, diabetes, and hypertension, BPH is the uh, f fourth most common uh, uh, disease for which uh, uh, patients present to, the, to our offices. More patients have histologic BPH than have uh, cl a clinically uh, uh, important uh, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, but these will be the patients that will present. The natural history of BPH is important to understand because in order to identify those patients at risk for progression, we need to understand what happens uh, in patients uh, if nothing's done. And in fact, uh, several studies have been performed where uh, in many patients, about 30%, uh, uh, their symptoms will remain stable over time. And in about 15% of patients, their symptoms will actually improve. And only in about 55% will the uh, symptoms worsen. And this is important because we, we don't always have to uh, 
start therapy for patients with lower urinary tract symptoms. First of all, uh, making sure that there's not anything significant or that requires immediate attention, cancer, infection, stones, and so on. But if we are assured that uh, we've eliminated these uh, diagnoses, that in many patients uh, the symptoms will remain stable or actually improve. And this is also one of the reasons that sometimes even the placebo effect in patients taking um, either medications or uh, other types of uh, uh, things in their diet, they feel that the improvement may be due to these, where in fact, as I mentioned, almost 50% uh, of patients will either have stable or improved uh, symptoms over time. But it's to identify the 55% that will uh, worsen, those are the patients that we really want to try to address and see how we can identify them and see what the appropriate therapy. One of the important tenets that I'd like you to take home that really wasn't apparent to me even as a resident and uh, when I first started into practice, and actually that many urologists uh, are not aware of, is that PBH is really a progressive disease, not unlike atherosclerosis. Um, BPH and lower urinary tract symptoms is oftentimes a surgical, surgical disease, but I actually look at it more as a medical disease now and a surgical disease only in extreme cases where uh, uh, conservative therapy has failed. Identifying those patients that have an increased prostate volume and have progressive worsening of symptoms with deterioration of urinary flow, those are the patients that will develop the increased risk of retention or the need for surgery. So if we can identify those patients at risk, then we can best adjust our ability to treat these patients and then be able to impart a benefit of appropriate therapy. The, um, the most Two of the most common manifestations of the uh, complications of progressive BPH are the, um, the development of acute urinary retention or the need for BPH-related surgery. In a general population of men over the age of 60, there's about a 23% lifetime risk of developing retention. That's, that's relatively significant. And this risk is further increased for those patients that have symptomatic BPH and an enlarged prostate so that you have a symptomatic lower urinary tract symptoms of an enlarged prostate in those men over the age of 60, that risk becomes almost 40% over a 20-year uh, lifetime. So these are significant numbers, and it makes it important for us to be able to identify who those patients are so that we may at least engage the patient in the decision-making process and institute appropriate therapy when necessary to be able to impede the progression of this disease. So who will experience accelerated prostate volume? Uh, who will develop worsening symptoms? Who will go into retention and require surgery? And there are some clinical tests that we can do that are now uh, been validated and that uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, very prominent urologic research across urban southwest Texas has identified the use of PSA as a predictive factor uh, in prostate growth. And we're all familiar with the controversy that surrounds the use of PSA as a screen test for prostate cancer, and that's beyond the scope of this particular discussion. But interestingly, the use of PSA as a predictive factor for prostate uh, uh, growth is really indisputable and has been validated by several studies. And patients that have a low PSA or in the low uh, tertiles, and we see here uh, we have a low, middle, and high tertiles of PSA uh, identification, the patients at risk are those patients with a higher level of PSA in terms of annualized growth uh, um, of the prostate gland. Uh, 